Thank you very much. It's, I must say it's uh, always intimidating to be here in uh, Geneva where the web was invented for all of us in the, in the internet industry, in internet history. This is a very special place. Welcome to the age of the impossible, managing disruptive futures in the new connected world. Four years ago, General Motors went bankrupt but it went bankrupt in one week. At the same, in the same period, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, taking down $600 billion in assets. It went bankrupt in one afternoon. Those were um, wake-up calls for us in the, the technical community, in the future-oriented community, and in the internet community because we suddenly realized that the traditional ways we had been planning, the traditional ways we had been forecasting or building scenarios for the future, those ways were failing. Optimization theory, uh, operations research, would be, which began at the end of World War II, scenario building, uh, cross-impact matrices, Delphi techniques, all those still apply to a well-behaved world, but they don't apply to the world we are entering now with the acceleration of technology that it, the internet, among other things, is making now possible. So I try to um, come up with a uh, typology of the impossible. And I did that by going back to my own roots in mathematics. Because what can you say about something that's impossible? You know, it's impossible. It's not going to happen, end of story. Except that we have something similar in mathematics with infinity. Uh, what can you say about an infinite number? It's bigger than anything else, end of story. Until you ask the question, are there some things that are more infinite than others? And when you ask that question, you can fairly easily prove that there are levels of infinity, that some things are in fact more infinite than others at one, two, three, four levels and more. So I try to do the same thing with the impossible, coming up with a typology of scenarios that are impossible but become possible because things have happened faster than we could imagine. Things that uh, have happened because of the convergence of several low priority scenarios Things that are impossible or look impossible because they, they violate our culture and things that demand alien concepts that are not in our culture. And I will give you a few examples of, of each. The uh, failure of General Motors in one week was an example of something that happened too fast. You could build a scenario of a failure of a very large company over four, five, six years. Bad marketing, bad models, bad financing, wrong people in the management. You can, you can imagine that kind of failure. But in one week, it means that uh, the, the environment itself has accelerated to precipitate a catastrophe. The second type is um, evidenced by this man, uh, Madoff. Bernie Madoff should still be in business. He had a very good business model. He was paying his um, investors 15% a year, year after year after year. He was paying them with the money he got from the new investors. And since they were all getting 15% a year, there was no reason for that to stop, except that two things happened. The regulators who had been told that this man was a crook failed to act, and the subprime crisis dried up his sources. Everything collapsed in one day with $60 billion of investments attached to his fund. Third type violates current culture, uh, just th like this novel by Van Vogt that I really love called The World of Null A. In The World of Null A, uh, there is a detective. It's a detective story in the 25th century. There is a machine running the solar system. This detective is hired to investigate the power plays behind the machine, and he gets killed. Now, this is lesson number one when you write a novel. You should not kill your main character in chapter two. <laughs> However, in chapter two, he is 
reincarnated, he's reborn, he's now on Venus with an expanded brain capacity. And um, this is something we can describe in words. I just did, and you understood it. Can we do it? No. Can we do it in 50 years? Maybe. Can we resuscitate somebody? We already do. But can we resuscitate somebody who is really dead, who has been assassinated? Maybe we will be able to do it in time. The fourth type is completely alien concept within a particular culture. Saddam Hussein could not imagine, and his generals could not imagine, that we could see his tanks at night through a dust storm. And we could. There are many things in our culture today that fit that model, things that are possible, but we cannot imagine them. The public is not aware that they can be done. History provides many examples, and the Internet itself is an example of something that was unimaginable. I had the privilege of working very early, in 1971, uh, on, in the early prototypes of the Internet, namely the ARPANET, with uh, Paul Barron, who invented uh, packet switching, and with Doug Engelbart, who invented, he's known for the invention of the mouse, but he invented many, many other things, including the first idea of a social community, of a socially connected uh, network. Um, the public worldwide discovered the Internet about 1995, Paul Barron invented packet switching in 1965, when the public, when the world developed the, an, an awareness for the internet, it had existed for 30 years. Other examples, the French had complete faith in the Maginot Line. They could not imagine that a small Blitzkrieg army could outflank them in a few days without firing a shot at the Maginot Line. Hitler and his generals could not conceive of a massive invasion by sea in a place that had no harbor. They initially failed to reinforce the uh, German divisions in Normandy because they expected that this was a diversion and the main, uh, the main invasion was going to be in the north of France, between Dunkirk and Le Havre, where you had magnificent harbor facilities. Eisenhower brought floating harbors with him. And that idea was so novel and so impossible that it was almost rejected by his staff. The French could not imagine a communication network that could not be controlled by the state centrally. So they preserved their, their $9 billion investment in Minitel and fell 30 years behind. In 1998, I remember, my colleagues in France remember, that France Telecom was still trying to kill the internet in France. And finally, the Pentagon could not imagine that fast, erratic, mobile, mobile oval objects in the sky were anything other than mental illusions. And they, um, and you can fill out the answers in the next few years. I want to end with three scenarios of impossible futures that may happen about the internet and about the connected society we're talking about. When Lehman Brothers went down in one afternoon, um, the US government realized that there were structures that were too big to fail. When AIG was on the verge of bankruptcy, the United States refinanced AIG rather than letting it fail because they thought it was too big to fail. It was not too big to fail. They were, these organizations were too connected to fail, and the connections were the dangers. And this has now been graphed and been studied. The, uh, the, the, the connections are both the opportunity, the facility in exchanging information, in exchanging uh, financial data, uh, in exchanging social data, but it's also the danger in the, the society that we are building. Another scenario that is, uh, I think, something that we should all be concerned with is what something has, somebody has called participatory dictatorship. Amir Weiner is a professor at Stanford, and I attended a, uh, a lecture by him. He brought to Stanford 
copies of the archives of the KGB from Latvia to Romania and Bulgaria. And he's been studying that at Stanford University and, and looking at the way in which the, essentially the Soviet Union took over the satellites, the Soviet satellites at the end of World War II. The lesson, the main lesson that comes out of studying the archives of the KGB in all those countries is that even though they did not know the countries and they did not know the languages, they were able to take over in two months. They took over by coming in with a stack of index cards where they had plotted all the important people in the society. They knew already who were the anti-communist uh, activists. They knew the, what the political di different political parties were doing. They uh, brought in these people, they interrogated them, they executed some of the people that they felt uh, were not uh, conducive to their taking over the power. And then they created different groups, and then within these groups, they started arresting people at random, bringing them to the headquarters of the KGB in all these countries. And they had one question for them. Who do you know? Who do you know? Who do you talk to? And what do you talk about? If somebody wanted to do that today in Asia, in North America, in Europe, they would not need to arrest people. They would, all they need to do is look at Facebook, Twitter, Google. We give this information every day to the network and to the, to the superstructure above the internet, above the web. This is something that we should be conscious of. I love the, the previous uh, speaker talking about cooperative information, the new sources of information within the network. But that network also contains the threat to our privacy, a threat to the connections between us, because that information now is easily available. The, the, it's not one big brother, it's a community of big brothers who know who we know. The third one, the third scenario that I think we should be concerned with is the Internet of Things. Today, more than 50% of the users of the internet are not human beings. They are not extraterrestrials either, I think. They are objects like locomotives, drones, cameras, satellites, sensors, pressure sensors, humidity sensors, locks on buildings, door locks, and uh, networks of various kinds. In the next three to four years, you're going to see the emergence of a number of startups with new types of gadgets that will report on your health, report on the quality of your environment, report on the safety of your house, of your town, all this to optimize a number of parameters that we need to optimize. The question is what happens after that? What happens when these robots start talking to each other? And what happens when they start connecting to each other without any human control over the decisions that they make. This has already happened on Wall Street uh, two or three years ago when the trading machines, which work faster than any trader, uh, started selling and buying stocks at, at a rate where nobody could follow anymore and there was a crash of the, uh, of the trading floors. Uh, this, there was a period of about 20 minutes where there was a wide gyration of all the stocks of the major companies like Procter & Gamble, IBM, and Xerox. This could happen again, but it could happen on a much larger scale. Today, there are 14,000 locomotives reporting every minute over the internet to a central office managed by two people. So my conclusion is that the connected world provides many examples of impossible futures both negative futures and positive futures also that we are going to need to explore and we don't have a lot of time to start building the methodologies to explore these futures. They create a dissonance between the existing cultures and the existing belief systems and the sudden emergence of new facts. Thank you very much. <laughs>